Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. When the increasingly radical New York Times announced the creation of the 1619 Project a year ago to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the arrival of slaves on American shores, its impact was limited mostly to radical leftists who were already heavily committed to the deconstruction of what they believed to be an American society predicated on white supremacy. But when the George Floyd tragedy unfolded before the eyes of America and the world, suddenly the 1619 Project became a prominent narrative as leftists, collectivists, progressives persuaded thousands, perhaps millions, of young white people already indoctrinated by anti-American educators across the land to be ashamed of themselves, to hate their own whiteness and their own heritage. Just how toxic is this view of the world where America's transformed from being a force for good to a force for evil? How much long-term impact might it have on the perceptions of Americans and the rest of the world? Joining us to help answer those questions is a deep thinker who's devoted much of his recent thought to this 1619 project and its tentacles. And he's author of the recent article entitled The Con Science of the 1619 Project, Onar Am of LibertyNation.com, who joins us from his native Norway. Hello, Onar. Hi there, Tim. It's a pleasure to have you back, as I keep telling you, it's been too long, but this whole 1619 project is based on what's called critical race theory, which turns history from the objective to the subjective. What exactly is critical race theory? It's uh, the very the brief version of it is is that it's a new version of Marxism, and it came with um, intellectuals from Germany called the Frankfurt School. They uh, they escaped from from Germany after World War Two. They were Marxists, but they understood that they couldn't compete uh, on economics ground with capitalism. So they reinvented Marxism in the name of identity politics. So they turned to, instead of setting up the, the working class against the capitalist class, they set up races and, and genders and various minorities against an oppressive system of, of, the, of the majority. So critical theory is basically Marxism in disguise and critical race theory is specifically uh, taking the sides of uh, racial minorities and using their so-called lived experiences as a substitute for objective truth. They say that there is no truth. There is only a lived experience. Well, How can we ever get an accurate account of actual history if everyone's history is based solely on their own experience so that actual facts get shoved to the background or even out of the conversation altogether? That's a very good question, Tim. And uh, the answer is that you can't because uh, according to critical race theory themselves, uh, the, the theorists say that there is no such thing as objective truth. There is no such thing as accurate history. There's only narrative, and whoever has the most power is the one who tells the best story. Uh, And they say, well, we want the the weak parties, the the, the oppressed, to be the ones to tell the stories. So they want uh, then the story of America to be told from the perspective of uh, racial minorities, in particular blacks, and their experience uh, with slavery. So they want to define history from that perspective. Now, you write in your article, quote, what if two people have different lived experiences? Whose personal truth takes precedence? The answer that critical race theory provides is that the arbiter of truth is victimhood. The, quote, lived experience of the greatest victim is always right. So are you saying the greatest self-perceived victims of history are the ones who should have the responsibility and privilege to write history? That is what the the critical theory uh, theorists say. They say precisely this, uh, that uh, the so-called history, that uh, objective history, is a product of white supremacy. So objectivity itself is white uh, white supremacy. So any claim of universal truth 
it has to be discarded as racist. And it has to be replaced with what they perceive as the more moral alternative, which is the lived experience of the so-called victim groups. And they get to define who the victims are. Well, now the 1619 Project Onar was widely criticized by, you know, serious accredited historians before it became unacceptable to criticize it after the George Floyd episode. One of the most what what would you say are the most prominent historical inaccuracies in the 1619 Project narrative? I don't actually have to have an opinion about that. I can just uh, parrot what the, the historians <laughs> okay, say. Okay, sure. Uh, so the historians basically say that the very premise of the project, the most important, uh, the, the foundation of the, uh, of the project is completely false. And that is uh, the, uh, the, 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 the starting article of the project is to say that the United States was in fact founded to save the institution of slavery. And that is a, a pure lie. They say that they were afraid that the British were going to come and abolish slavery and that in order to save slavery, they they had to create uh, an institution that can preserve slavery. That is absurd, and it is as far away from the truth as you can get. It doesn't. It's pure fantasy. But uh, as long as it can be said to be the lived experience of some someone who is in the right victim group, fantasy is the truth. Onar, in your article, you also write, and this is profound. Amazingly, critical race theorists here agree with those white supremacists of the 19th century that defended slavery. The only difference is that the former regards these properties as unfavorable. So are you saying that racists and critical race theorists actually view the world through the same lens where race or victimhood is the only real factor? Uh, it's, it, it certainly appears so, and I don't actually have to use any kind of uh, rhetoric or uh, uh, exaggerations. I can use their own words. The Smithsonian Institute uh, put out uh, a, a, a history uh, of, of blacks where they defined what uh, whiteness was, and they said this is in a negative fashion. And they said that such things as um, individualism, being on time, being timely, uh, objectivity, science, logic, reason, all of these things, and, uh, and also being uh, having a Protestant work ethic, not being lazy. The, all of these are signs of whiteness. And if you had asked any white supremacists in the 19th century, they would have been nodding and say, yep, that's, that's true. whiteness. And, and so what this really reveals from the Smithsonian and like-minded people in the left-wing cultural establishments of the United States is that they're insulting black people because they're saying that black people don't have any of those qualities that you just described. Isn't that what they're really saying? Yes. In one sense, um, they are uh, white supremacists with a guilty conscience. They agree wholeheartedly with white supremacy and everything in every single fashion, except for one thing. They think that they are uh, it's a bad, uh, bad thing to be a white supremacist. But they agree with all the statements of white supremacy. Right. They agree with the whole context in which uh, the human race should be viewed. I want to ask you this living at some distance from the U.S., but studying us and seeing us from afar, but also up close. How do you react, and those that you know react, when you see these almost all-white gangs of criminals starting riots every night in the name somehow of racial justice, no action taken to stop them as they riot and try to burn down a federal courthouse and anything else they can set ablaze? How do you react to that? Well, uh, there are two reactions. There are those who are uh, what I would call uninformed. They, they just watch the news. And the news in, uh, in Europe is just a rehash of MSNBC and CNN. So they get uh, basically no news about what's going on in America. Those who pay attention to those channels, they, they don't know anything about what's going on in America. And they don't understand anything. 
those who pay a little bit more attention, and especially who are students of history, recognize very well what's going on in the U.S. because it happened in 1917 in, in Russia. That's the Bolshevik Revolution. It happened in China in 1949. It happened in, uh, in the 1970s in uh, Cambodia with Pol Pot, where people were murdered simply for wearing glasses. If they had actual power, which we have seen in certain cases, they would uh, become exactly what we saw in Russia, in, uh, in Cambodia, and in China. In Europe, we, have, we, we know this history better than Americans uh, because we live closer to the Soviet Union. We have them next door. Well, that's a, a very useful point. It's been up close and personal for people that weren't separated by an ocean from a communist tyranny. Onar, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.